Werewolves. Throughout history, people have claimed to had interactions with people that could transform into wolves under the full moon. Relegated to Hollywood monster movies, could it be legend based on truth? In the 90s, people had encounters with what they called the Beast of Bray Road, thus spawning the word Dogman. Sightings of the Dogman continue to this day all over the U.S. Is there any truth to these claims? Hi, welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Eli Watson. In today's episode, we're going to be exploring the world of werewolves or shapeshifters, dogman, if you will. Stories of werewolves have been around for almost as long as mankind itself. And in modern day, we've reduced these stories to folk tales, just pure mythology, basically reserved for the realm of fiction in Hollywood movies, like that can't happen. But there are people who claim to have witnessed things that could be described as werewolves. In the early 1990s in the small town of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, people began to see something that they could only describe as an upright canine. The people seeing this creature all seem to have their sighting along one lone stretch of road just outside of town called Bray Road. And this wave of sightings became known as the Beast of Bray Road. The Beast of Bray Road is basically the first really thoroughly documented and appropriately spread dogman case. I think that some people could also argue that it might be the first Dogman case. It kind of depends on your perspective, of course, of the Dogman phenomenon. But essentially, the Beast of Bray Road was this name given to a werewolf or a Dogman-like creature that was supposedly seen by people uh, along Bray Road in the general area of Elkhorn, Wisconsin. First reportings were back in like 1936, but in the 80s and 90s is when it kind of like started to grow in popularity, more people started reporting sightings. What you've got when you're talking about the Beast of Bray Road is a collection of sighting reports by individuals who describe something close to a uh, humanoid canid. So picture a sort of traditional maybe Hollywood werewolf. That's not precisely correct, but it'll get you pretty close in terms of a uh, generalized description of, of what these people say that they are seeing. And this was a series of sightings that were brought to light by Linda Godfrey, who at the time was a journalist and she rose to cryptozoological fame. And she unfortunately passed away recently, but she was definitely the person that not only helped coin the term the Beast of Bray Road, but really made, you know, Bray Road popular and made the phenomenon as a result popular as well. And perhaps the most famous story of the Beast of Bray Road is the story of a woman named Lori Andreezy. It was the fall of 1989, and it took her about two years before she came forward and told this story. But what had happened was Lori was on her way home. It was about 1.30 in the morning, and she was driving along Bray Road when her headlights illuminated something off to the side of the road. From what she could tell, its back was turned to her, so she could see its ears and the fur covering its body. But instead of running away as she approached, like most animals would do, this thing turned and it looked at her. 
she got a really good look at this thing and said it was kneeling on two legs with claws up and it was holding something in its hands something that looked like roadkill and it was eating it and it had a canine like face the only word that she could find to properly describe what she had seen was werewolf eventually this thing gave her the creeps and she drove away And Dreezy believed that whatever she had seen that night was satanic in nature. However, I do want to point out that although Andreezy uses the word werewolf to describe what she had seen, she told investigator Linda Godfrey that she doesn't believe in werewolves, but rather that she believes that some things can be conjured up. Now, I'm not going to cover the entire story of the Beast of Bray Road in depth because actually Small Town Monsters already has done that. Our film, The Bray Road Beast, covers the Beast of Bray Road and all the sightings, as well as interviews Linda Godfrey, the head researcher of the whole thing, and tells a very, very complete story of the Beast of Bray Road in about 70 minutes. And if you're interested in watching that, check it out on Amazon Prime. I will link that movie in the description below. I do want to bring up the case of the Beast of Bray Road because it's really the starting point of all of this, of the modern dogman phenomenon. It brought the idea of werewolves out of just purely fiction and as something that people are actually seeing in a way that it hadn't been for a very, very long time. And to fully explore why that happened, we need to talk about Linda Godfrey. So Linda Godfrey was a journalist working for the local Elkhorn paper, The Week, which came out every Sunday. And as she describes in her book, The Beast of Bray Road, it was a slow time for stories. And she was kind of looking around for something to publish. And coincidentally enough, she was contacted by another journalist. This person wished to remain anonymous, but was someone who had connections to Lori and Dreezy and didn't want to publish that story themselves because of their connection to the whole thing. And they also feared ridicule, but decided that the story needed to be published and passed it on to Linda Godfrey. I began to call upon these people. And when I went to interview them in person, I discovered I did not think that they were crazy or trying to hoax something. They came from a very wide demographic. There were older, younger, male, female, blue collar, white collar. And I thought, well, there's something. They're seeing something. I didn't know what it was. I thought at the very least, it could be possibly a dangerous predator and that people in the area had the right to know that something unusual was around so they could keep an eye on the pets and the young children. And I decided that if it was not, some type of predator acting weirdly, you know, just that happened to be able to raise on its feet every once in a while, because that is not a supernatural thing. Any mammal can walk on its hind legs for a short period of time if it wants to. But I thought, if nothing else, it was probably folklore in the making because the rumor had grown so widespread. People were talking about it. It was perfect for campfire stories. And I thought, well, this is pretty neat that I get to be at the central view of something that is turning into folklore and I thought that made it worthwhile too. I remember my editor and I had talked about it and said yeah local people will have fun with it for a couple of weeks and then it'll just go away you know pass into that kind of never never land of long gone newspaper stories and nothing could have been further from the truth you know it it had legs no pun intended the story just stuck and grew bigger and bigger and after 10 years at the newspaper I finally decided I really wanted to write a book about it because I wanted it all recorded in one place where people could look at that book and say, oh, okay, this is what happened, then this, then this, and it would be all the actual story. It got really, really popular very, very fast. And part of that might actually be the location of where it was coming from. A small rural town in Wisconsin that not a lot of people have heard about. According to Linda Godfrey, it's perfect for uh, like a Christmas card town. So people take pictures of the buildings and make Christmas cards out of them. So the setting of such a picturesque town 
and the horrific side of a werewolf that was terrorizing people, those two things didn't really mesh. And I think that also sparked a lot of interest in the story because there was a lot of built-in clashing contrast, if you will. And that brings us to the next thing, which is Bray Road itself. Bray Road is a fairly unremarkable road, honestly. It exists in an area that is rural, but it's not unpopulated. You know, Elkhorn is a, a, a mid-sized city in, in southeastern Wisconsin, and that area along Bray Road mostly consists of, of farms, but, you know, there are houses out there. People do live out there. It's not incredibly forested. You know, there are woods, and it is close to the, the Kettle Moraine State Forest, but that particular area isn't necessarily remote in the way that one might expect when hearing about a series of, of monster sightings. But it's got what I like to call the, the lake monster effect of it. You know, a lake is just a lake that's nothing until someone says that there's something in it, then it becomes something of itself. And that's kind of what Bray Road has become. It's become something more than a road. It's become its own thing. It's become a specific place in terms of monster lore and cryptozoology and the supernatural. Just going to Bray Road itself is something that people want to do because of the history around it, much like, you know, Loch Ness or Lake Okanagan. If you go there, you're more than likely not going to see anything, but it's being able to say that I've been there, I've, I've stood on the road, I've looked at the spots where these encounters were said to have, have happened. At just over three miles long, Bray Road connects Highway 11, which is east of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, to County Road NN, and is surrounded by farms on both sides. There's not a whole lot of woods along it, so it's a very unique setting for a werewolf. So in my opinion, if the Beastie Bray Road is in fact what people claim to have seen, it was a, you know, it was a one-off sighting. It was a series of sightings of a larger dogman phenomenon that is reported throughout Wisconsin and, you know, most of the country in general. But I spoke with a gentleman on one of my research trips out there, and he said that the original, one of the original sightings, if not the original sighting, was a man that was known in the Elkhorn area as kind of like the town drunk. He was kind of a homeless man, but he would always wear a very large, thick, grayish fur coat. And the story that he told me was that this guy was actually out on Bray Road for whatever reason, stumbling around drunk in the night and was hit by a car or was kind of seen on the side of the road. And that is kind of where the original sighting originated from. And then it kind of, through other people reporting, somewhat similar things or a little bit more detailed uh, sightings, it kind of transformed into this creature. Obviously, I think with how popular the Beast of Bray Road was, people might have been eager to fool people. And Godfrey actually confirmed the presence of at least one hoaxer during the wave of sightings. And apparently it was perpetrated by someone who lived on Bray Road and was sick and tired of teenagers parking in his field to make out. And so this farmer bought a gorilla suit and anytime he saw teenagers parking in his field, he would go out there and freak them out. The teenagers would leave freaked out thinking they had an encounter with the Beast of Bray Road. Obviously, Linda figured out who that was, got to the bottom of it, and was able to kind of remove those stories from the ultimate narrative of the Beast of Bray Road, but it is confirmed that there was at least some hoaxing going on, but there's certain sightings where hoaxing doesn't seem like it would have been possible. We also have sightings from other places in Wisconsin, proving that this wasn't a localized phenomenon in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. We also have sightings from all over the country as well. It's interesting because I discovered too, as people started writing to me, that there were different names for the same thing all around the country. The descriptions people gave of the Michigan Dog Man were no different than the descriptions people gave of the Beast of Bray Road. 
And in some southern states, they would call it the Lugaru, which is French for werewolf, or the Rougarou, which is the Cajun variation. There's also sightings in Texas, which Aaron Deese covers very well in his book, The Dogman Triangle, which I will try to link below as well. And there's a few sightings here in the state of California. So the phenomena is widespread. I also want to say that a good chunk of these sightings occurred prior to the Beast of Bray Road case, so pre-1990s. So before Dogman, the word Dogman was ever in the vernacular, and before Linda Godfrey came on the scene. So it's interesting that people were having sightings of these things prior to a werewolf making national headlines, because in my opinion, that adds credibility to the phenomena as a whole. It's not just people piggybacking off of something that is popular in the mainstream at that time. If people are seeing something that is actually there, they're gonna be seeing it whether it's popular or not. And I think the presence of a historical record of these things goes a long way to suggesting that this is a real phenomenon. But on the other side of the coin, we have a bunch of stories and no tangible proof. At least with Sasquatch, we have footprints, we have hair samples, we have supposed scat samples, things like that. But with werewolves, we don't have any footprints, we don't have any physical evidence. Besides, some stories include them scratching the side of a car, and people have photographs of their cars being scratched, but hey. I'm gonna throw this out there, those could be fake. So we have just a bunch of stories. And eyewitness testimony is not always accurate. According to an article titled, How Reliable is Eyewitness Testimony? by Michael C. Dorff, the error rates of eyewitness accounts is about 50%. And this is specifically in regards to details about people's clothing, details about people's facial features in a police lineup type setting, and people are wrong about 50% of the time. So that's pretty extreme. That's not very reliable. I would argue though, on the other side, is that I feel like it's easier to misidentify a person than it is to misidentify an upright walking canine that's chasing after you. That that's just my opinion though, I could be wrong. Maybe you're maybe you're more incorrect in that type of situation. But let's assume that 50% of the eyewitnesses of the dogman phenomena are misidentifying people or misidentifying different animals. What you have then is 50% of eyewitnesses actually seeing what they said they saw. But there's still no evidence and that provides a conundrum, right? Because people are seeing something and there is no physical or tangible proof of that. In terms of the evidence base for Dogman, unfortunately, it kind of leaves a lot to be desired. We have some footage, we have some photos, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, and we have some track evidence. Those are the four broad categories that we're really working with. Unfortunately, most of it is fake. And it's actually very easy to prove that it's fake. I produced a series with Eli Watson back in 2021 called The Manwolf Files. And The Manwolf Files is a web series, it's a documentary series that sort of tries to explore specific pieces or specific stories from the dogman phenomenon and try to really look at it with a detective-like and analytical lens, try and figure out what's really going on in these pieces of evidence. And one thing that we immediately uncovered, and I mean like in the first episode uncovered, was that most of the most famous alleged photographs of Dogman that really circulate a lot every few years are really easily proven as fake. I mean, there's one that depicts a uh, what people were calling a Dogman dashing across the backyard of a farm at night, and an image that is the same photograph but without the Dogman inserted into it can be found earlier uploaded onto the internet than the actual Dogman version of the photo. So obviously it's a photo that someone snagged from a blog online and, and threw a Dogman picture into. It's it's unfortunately like that in a lot, and yeah, I mean a lot of cases. And pareidolia is a big thing in the Dogman phenomenon as well. The Dogman evidence base, it, it just leaves not just a lot, it leaves pretty much everything to be desired. It's really quite a, uh, it's not 
there's not a strong case outside of the anecdotal made for this phenomenon right now. And of course that, you know, that raises the question of why. Why is it that unlike something like Bigfoot, right, where even though there is a lot of pareidolia and even though there is a lot of really just kind of nothing photos and nothing footage, there's also a really big amount of really interesting tracks, really interesting audio footage, handprints, anecdotal evidence that lines up with people who didn't know each other at the same time, seeing the same thing at the same time. So why is it that Dogman's different? I think part of the reason that Dogman is different in that regard specifically is because the people who by and large, got involved in the Dogman discussion space once it really kind of blew up on the internet, were people who, and this isn't a negative term per se, it's just the case, they're kind of horror junkies in a way, right? It's people who really enjoyed the 1980s werewolf movies, you know, stuff like Dog Soldiers, The Howling, stuff like that. And so there's a great base of people who got into Dogman because they were initially into werewolves. And I think that there is this sort of cultural mix that's happening where I don't think that those people are necessarily by and large more gullible or more easy to convince of a photo, but I think that they're more willing to treat a photo that really has nothing in it or a video that has nothing in it favorably because part of this phenomenon, rather than it being investigative for a lot of those people, is really just fun. The celebration of the idea of werewolves, it's a cool niche subject to get into, and there's nothing particularly wrong with that culturally. But it is the case that I think that in terms of detective work and in terms of an analytical perspectives, that has muddied a lot of the waters and allowed a lot of this really, really just empty evidence to remain stationed where it is, and a lot of the hoaxes to remain stationed where they are as well. Despite the lack of evidence, we have 50% of people who are actually seeing what they said they saw. And what exactly are they seeing? It seems simple on the surface, but uh, relatively difficult to answer because, quite frankly, nobody knows what dogmen are. Nobody knows for sure that they exist or that they exist in the way that people seem to experience them. Alleged eyewitnesses tend to describe Dogman as a, well, there's some variety, but I think what's interesting is that there is some kind of broad, but also specific levels of commonality. So, of course, the typical Dogman is usually described, or at least thought of, as a werewolf, so to speak, right? This sort of very large, two-legged canine that is built like like a man. The height ranges anywhere from six to eight feet, depending on reports. It's supposed to be extremely muscular, extremely fast. And the head is often described like that of a, a wolf or um, something similar to like a German shepherd. You know, covered in hair, usually these hands that have sort of paw-like features, but are mostly clawed hands. Backwards legs are mentioned a lot. And I think by backwards legs, people tend to mean the sort of the odd bend that you see in the quadrupeds, so like canines. Many modern werewolf depictions in Hollywood would pretty much capture what many people believe a dogman to look like. Now, there have been accounts of encounters with dogman outside of Bray Road and Elkhorn, although the majority of them are still relegated to that southeastern part of the, the state. In Janesville, in Rock County, not too far from, from where we're at right now, there was, in the early 2000s, a group of three teenagers who were out walking the trails kind of alongside some, some old bridges, some old railroad stuff. And they said that they came upon a creek and as they turned, they saw three, three creatures which could be described best as modern depictions of dogmen. And they reported these dogmen that were actually drinking from yams. And they were actually, you know, bringing the water up to their mouth. I ended up giving them all polygraph tests and they all passed. It's amazing. And the bottom line, I think there's, people are seeing something. We just don't, we don't know what. Obviously, this doesn't match the description of any known animal. And the idea of people transforming into werewolves under the light of the full moon is a little too far-fetched for most people to accept, I would say. So that leaves us with the question is, what exactly are these things? Well, Linda Godfrey had a suggestion. I called it the indigenous dogman because it seemed to me that it did appear 
slightly more dog-like than, than wolf-like. I was reasoning it could have been something that with just a very minor mutation of slightly larger paws and maybe some sort of adjustment in the spinal column that perhaps it was advantageous for it to be able to stand up. And in an area where you once had prairie with tall grasses, if you're down on all fours, you can't see what's coming towards you, almost impossible to see where you're going. And if you stand up, you can see other predators coming at you or, or deer standing with their heads above the corn. So there were advantages that I could see in having this posture once in a while. So I just thought, well, you know, if it's advantageous and then more of these reproduce, you know, it's the natural law of adaptation, that more of them would um, persist in these grassland areas. And it also does seem to fit that it is these original prairie states that you have the big concentration of sightings. And then they tend to kind of spike out into other portions of the U.S. where there would be suitable habitat from that. Essentially, what it boils down to is the dog man is an evolutionary offshoot of the canine. It would essentially still be a dog, but it would be a dog that's bigger than other dogs and also can stand up on two legs for a greater length of time, even going so far as to be able to walk on two legs in a way that other canines cannot. Any body found would essentially look just like a regular canine. And if this thing were to be walking around on all fours, it would just be mistaken as just another large dog or a wolf. And something like that might be well adapted to hide and stay hidden, especially in rugged terrain in a place like the Kettle Moraine, which is very, very close to Elkhorn, Wisconsin. The Kettle Moraine, for anybody who doesn't know, is a huge geographic area formed by the movement of glaciers. So basically this glacier came through and piled up all this rock and debris in these, you know, what they would call foothills. But it also left an area of just great dense forest. So it is a vast state forest covering much of southeast Wisconsin. It is named for the glacial formations that are found throughout so many hills and ridges and valleys. So if you could picture like a, a kettle going into the ground there, that's basically what you've got. So you've got these, these relatively steep hills with fairly you know, steep drop-offs. It's kind of broke up into two units. It's you know, north and south. The southern unit is more in like southern Wisconsin. That's actually near like Elkhorn Bray Road. Northern units farther north. I mean, it's it's a huge, long band of, of this, this dense forest. You know, I know a lot of people, researchers in Wisconsin, that that's kind of like their main stomping ground. That's where they only go. And they have tons of kind of strange activity. So we were out there again doing some just general dog man. We did, really weren't out there specifically for BC Bear Road. We went there, but more so just because we were in the area. We chose the northern unit just because we had not been there. It looked a little bit more of a thicker forest, a little bit more dense. And it was, like I said, it was not as in a populated area as the southern unit is. So we were hiking in and to kind of start our night investigation. So, I mean, it was still daylight when we, you know, had walked in. And my uh, fellow researcher, Michaela, my cousin, happened to look down as we were walking and was like, uh, Nash, you need to see this. So myself and the rest of the members of my team stopped and they were everywhere. Just these large, deep footprints in the mud that were clearly canine. You know, obviously we were all excited because it was like, okay, we have, we found something that fits eyewitness descriptions of, it, you know, large footprints. And we, you know, we took out our phones and we started looking at like footprint databases, you know, what could it be, you know, like, okay, this is, what a uh, greyhound's footprint looks like. Obviously all canine, but we're looking at size. Like, was somebody out here walking their Great Dane? Probably not. We did hear howling that night. So it, it seemed like it was more in the, the realm that we did come across wolf footprints, which the gray wolf has recently, within the last like probably 20, 30 years, has been reintroduced into Wisconsin. So one of my theories is that people are seeing gray wolves for the first time, which can get very large and either have never seen a wolf in person before and their minds are just kind of associating seeing this with 
you know, certain stories of dogma. Now, something I find interesting about Linda Godfrey's research is that she did not limit herself solely to contemporary resources. She dug into the history of these creatures. One of the most interesting cases occurred in 1936 at a Catholic convent called St. Coletta, just outside of Jefferson, Wisconsin. The story was reported by the witness's son. Mark Shackleman was the name of the witness, and he was a night watchman in 1936 at St. Coletta. One night while he was on watch, he came across a creature that was kneeling on top of a Native American burial mound, and it appeared to be digging into it. But as he approached closer to it, it leapt away and kind of escaped. The next night, he showed up, this time with a large flashlight, which was going to be his kind of weapon of choice. He checked out the same Native American burial mound, and he found the exact same thing. This creature was kneeled the top of the mound and was digging into it. This time, it didn't run away. It stood up and stared at him. And at full height, he estimated this thing to be about six feet tall. As they were staring at each other, this thing growled out a word, something that sounded like Gadara. Mark Shackleman didn't know what to do, so he just started praying. And as he prayed, this thing ended up turning and walking away kind of slowly. Shackleman felt like this thing was sneering at him as it left. Shackleman never saw it again, and he himself just told his son about it, and his son is the one who told Linda Godfrey. One interesting correlation that Linda Godfrey came across, though, was that the word that was spoken by the creature, Gadara, with a biblical location name. Gadara, in the Bible, was where Jesus exercised a man of demons and these demons then possessed a herd of pigs who threw themselves off an embankment. I'm not sure of how concrete of a connection that is, but it is an interesting connection nevertheless, which honestly brings me to the greatest dogman debate there is, which is, are these things a physical creature or are these things of a supernatural or a paranormal origin? It's hard to answer a question as whether or not the dogman is a physical or supernatural phenomenon. And I say that because I'm somebody who tends to lean towards the physical. I'm not necessarily unconvinced or convinced of the supernatural. It's something I consider that I understand so little that for me to jump to it as a conclusion would probably not be the best option. Personally, I don't think it could be a physical thing. If anything were to exist of it at all, which I haven't settled on either or, or against it, I'd say that would, it would more than likely have to be a supernatural thing because I don't believe that something like a humanoid dog could exist. You know, it's interesting because before I got into this, I probably would have leaned more like a physical, biological, more or less undiscovered creature. But after learning more about it and reading Linda's work, and doing our own investigating, I lean supernatural. It's difficult for me to make any sort of definitive determination, you know, when it comes to the biology, if you will, of a creature that we don't have strong evidence or, or, or physical proof of, of even existing. That isn't to say that it doesn't, um, but it is to say that with the evidence we have now, it would be very difficult to say reliably one way or the other. What I will say is that the way people describe Dogman, it seems biologically improbable, if not impossible, to exist in the way that it is, it, that it is described. But at the same time, uh, there are some reports of uh, physical evidence having been left. And so in the case of that, of course, then you have to at least consider the possibility that there is uh, some physical manifestation. There's definitely the people that kind of go off on that more paranormal angle. I've had people come and talk to me and say that it's a Native American spirit and you 
have to leave like sacrifices for it to reveal itself. I don't have that kind of belief. For me, it would have to be something physical and it just doesn't seem likely. They're just, I don't know, biologically it doesn't make sense. Bigfoot makes sense because it's basically a primate. It looks like a gorilla. There's no other animal that's parallel evolving like a dog man other than a gray wolf or a coyote. But they walk on all fours. We were talking about an upright walking hominid that has wolf or dog or cannon like features. So I just sitting on the fence, you know, I'm open minded, not going to judge because I don't think we really should judge and criticize eyewitnesses. The ones I've talked to are very, very sincere and they know what they saw. It's tough. Dogman the one's tough. I mean, it's pretty new. People are really finally kind of starting to do more Dogman specific research. So who knows? Uh, more stuff might come out in the coming years. But as of right now, there's really nothing that supports this being a flesh and blood animal that is something undiscovered or what people are reporting. If I had to pick one, I would say physical, but I also think that there's much more to it than that. For one thing, you'd have to assume that Dogman exists to label it as either. And I'm not particularly convinced that Dogman does exist. I'm convinced that there is a phenomenon that is facilitating the belief in Dogman through people who think that they've seen Dogman or people who are convinced by the evidence base that there is such thing as Dogman. What the cause and the origin of that that I don't know. I don't know the nature of that either. It could be supernatural, but it depends what you mean by supernatural in that case. There's a lot of different views on what that really means. Do you mean spiritual? Do you mean religious? Do you mean that supernatural just means something we don't understand yet? You know, it's a very complicated answer. And I think the best answer would be, it is a phenomenon that we, at the very least, on a psychological level, do not understand the cause for exactly just yet. A lot of people don't like to hear any hint that there might be something out of our usual ideas of reality about these creatures. And it's the same with any other of the unknown cryptid or hidden animals. People want them to either be completely flesh and blood or something completely in the spirit world. And for a long time, I was kind of poo-pooing some of the slightly more far out, shall we say, stories myself. And I finally realized that I was self-editing and self-limiting what people were reporting to me, letting my own biases get in the way of reporting what actually was being said by the witnesses. So I started paying more attention to these things than I had. One thing that I realized right away was that you couldn't say, well, the flesh and blood witnesses are all these sober, sensible folks, and the ones who are having stranger experiences are something else. They were the same. You could have intermixed them. They were the same. It was a mix of people, and they also were coming up with strange things. And I do think it's important to study both kinds. It doesn't mean you have to believe any one thing or another, or change your religious system or anything else. It just means you are allowing for the fact that some people are having other experiences, seeing other things, and having quite unusual encounters. Personally, I find that Dogman as a physical creature to be a biological improbability. I won't say it's an impossibility because there's a lot of weird animals out there that do weird things that you just like, how does an animal like that even exist? Like an octopus. So I won't say it's an impossibility, but it is, to me, improbable because dogs are built to walk quadrupedally. And if we're taking into account the indigenous dogman theory, we would have to consider the physical changes to the skeletal system required in order to make a canine be able to stand up on two legs for a great length of time and be able to walk comfortably like that. I'm not talking about your dog walking up cutesy on two legs for a little bit. I'm talking about a canine being able to rise to two legs and chase a car that's going 40 miles an hour. 
in which case you would expect a different pelvis, different hips, a different leg structure, at least in the back. A lot of these things are reported with broad shoulders that are more man-like, which obviously dogs don't have broad shoulders like people do. Dogs just aren't built like werewolves. So the proposed idea that if a skeletal body of these things was found that we would just mistake it for a dog doesn't even make sense because anyone who knows a modicum of anthropology and knows how skeletal system works would look right at that and be like, that is not a dog. And as far as I know, no skeleton of a canine that was able to walk upright bipedally for any length of time has been found. So that puts me into the paranormal camp. And I don't usually jump to that type of conclusion. Dogman or werewolves, as I think they are, is a paranormal phenomenon. I'm also not saying that to conveniently explain away the lack of evidence, like something goofy like, oh, ghosts don't leave footprints, bro. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I don't believe that people transform under the light of the full moon, like in Hollywood movies. That's, that, as far as I know, that's completely made up. Because in most traditions, in order to shapeshift into a wolf, or any kind of animal, it's not by being bitten by a werewolf, it's by performing certain rituals that would allow you to do that. Dogman throughout a historical timeline of, let's say, sightings, or even through culture, it's very hard to track because ultimately, what counts as a dogman report or a dogman description in history is really, really hard to tell. So if we're discussing werewolves, and specifically traditions that use that word werewolf, we can trace those legends back through French and Germanic folklore. And I just want to point out that places like Green Bay, Wisconsin, and Louisiana definitely had an influx of French and German settlers. So it makes sense that Wisconsin and Louisiana in terms of the United States would have more, I guess, werewolf stories. You know, Wisconsin has the Beast of Bray Road, Louisiana has the Rougarou, which itself is a transformed version of the French word Lugarou, which is werewolf. And most famously, people often point to this case that occurred in the 1760s in the Gévaudan region of France is La Bête de Gévaudan. The Beast of Gévaudan, which is, in my opinion, erroneously called one of the most famous werewolf cases. As it's told in the 1760s, this werewolf was terrorizing this entire region in France. And multiple people got involved, the government got involved to try to hunt this thing down, and they couldn't kill it. A lot of villagers were brutally murdered. I'm talking about like being killed just outside their front door and half eaten and their heads bitten off and all sorts of crazy stuff. And I'm not denying that that stuff happened. What I'm saying is that it was not a werewolf. What I think it was is it was a dog wolf hybrid that was highly, highly aggressive. I'm not gonna go much deeper into this case, but if you want to hear me talk about it more, check out my podcast, Cryptid Campfire. I'll link that in the description below as well. The reason I bring it up is not to debunk it, if you will, but rather to point out the significance of the fact that people were willing to believe in a werewolf. You could chalk it up to just a cultural belief because obviously, like I just mentioned, it followed the French settlers to the state of Louisiana, where we have the Rougarou legend. Going back to Europe, in Germany, during the start of the Thirty Years' War, which is about 1525-ish, we have a man named Peter Stubb. Stubb was executed for being a werewolf, and reportedly, he confessed that he had made a pact with Satan and he had been granted a magic fur belt that would transform him into a gigantic wolf. I want you to hold on to that piece of information of the magic fur belt, but as the story goes, he was found 
when a hunting party went out to go hunt this wolf and they found this wolf and then it transformed into a man before their very eyes and that man was Peter Stubb and reportedly he had killed at least 15 people and they executed him for being a cannibal as well as for being a sorcerer and a plethora of other crimes and they executed him so much so that apparently there was absolutely nothing left of his body after they were done with him. Now my personal opinion on that is I don't know if we can consider Peter Stubb actual evidence of a werewolf because it's quite possible the dude was a cannibal and they accentuated his cannibalistic behavior and turned him into a veritable monster and then executed him and they perhaps exaggerated his crimes to justify the extreme measures they went to punish him. But none of us were there. That happened 500 years ago. So who's to say what actually happened? And that calls into another situation, the medieval inquisition, which is throughout the 1500s and into the early 1600s. Sort of like the Salem witch trials that you had in the American colonies, you had people in France who were confessing to being witches and to being werewolves. If you admitted you were a werewolf or somebody could prove that you were a werewolf, you were dead meat. You would be executed in most cases for the years that these uh, trials were going on at, the, at their greatest height. Over 30,000 people were convicted and executed for being a quote-unquote werewolf. Now, I don't think that there was 30,000 werewolves running around medieval Europe but again, this brings up the point that people believed in werewolves at that point in time. And people were so willing to believe in werewolves that they were actually able to be worked up into a hysteria about it and willing to kill so many people over that belief. It draws some parallels to like a satanic panic type situation because it wasn't so much the werewolf that people were afraid of, but it was the way you became a werewolf, which was making a pact with Satan, like Peter Stubb. And I think it was that satanic connection that people were executing people for more than anything else. I want to take a step back from the werewolf traditions, and I want to look at shape-shifting as a whole, because people have had traditions about shape-shifting for a very, very long time. And I think it's an important point to look at when discussing dogman or werewolves. There are different types of shape-shifting stories. So the first example is the story of the first werewolf, the story of Lycan, where the word Lycan actually comes from. Lycan was the mythological king of Arcadia. He was having the Greek god Zeus over for dinner and he wanted to test Zeus's omnipotence. So Lycan killed his own son and then cooked him and served him to Zeus to see if Zeus would be able to realize he had been served human flesh. And well, Zeus figured it out and turned Lycan into a wolf as a punishment. And that I see brought up a lot when discussing werewolves, but I don't think we can even cite that story as evidence of werewolfism or a belief in werewolfism. Instead, if we're really looking at the story in the proper context, what we'll discover is that the kingdom of Arcadia practiced cannibalism. In other parts of Greece, where this myth originated from, was basically saying that the people of Arcadia who practice cannibalism are no better than wolves. That's what that myth is saying. It's a, it's a social commentary, if you will, rather than anything based on physical transformation. So it's a symbolic representation of a message or concept that the storyteller that the myth maker was trying to convey. A lot of shape-shifting stories are actually this type of message, or they're creation stories for animals. Like, for example, we have the story of Arachne, who was transformed into a spider for weaving a tapestry that offended the gods. And obviously, 
what do spiders do? They weave webs, and that's where the kind of spider comes from in Greek mythology. Or the story of Electrion, who is turned into a rooster to hearken the coming of the morning because he forgot to do that. So what do you make of those stories? Are those people are actually transforming into roosters and spiders? Or are those just, again, symbolic representations that provide social commentary? Right after those types of stories, the other most common motif that I come across is that animals will transform into people for the purposes of deception. So you have like the stories of the Selkie, which is a seal that will remove its skin to make contact with people for an extended period of time before it has to return to the ocean and then transform back into a seal. You kind of have like a Little Mermaid situation going on with that one. Or there's also the Kelpie, which is a creature that will transform into a horse or a beautiful woman and lay in wait for a traveler to come by so then it can kill them and eat them and drag them back into their watery graves. Again, that's not what we're discussing when we're talking about werewolves, right? Because a werewolf is a person that will transform into an animal and then transform back into a person. A few other things I want to touch on that I do not think are evidence of werewolves or dogman is something like Anubis. People will bring up Anubis. Well, oh, it's got the head of a jackal and a humanoid body. Again, I don't think that Anubis is evidence of dogman because, well, what was Anubis? Anubis was the Egyptian god of the underworld, the person who carried off your soul. The jackal, the physical counterpart of Anubis, if you will, was a scavenger or is a scavenger and takes care of bodies that are left unburied and things like that. So you have the physical aspect of Anubis, which takes care of the physical body, and then the spiritual aspect of Anubis, which takes care of the spiritual side of your body. I don't think that's based on physical eyewitness description. I think Anubis is a symbolic representation of a belief system. You know, animism like that goes all the way back. Some of the first cave paintings that we have are these half animal, half human images. So if you wanna go into the imagery of something like Dogman, it goes all the way back. You also have cases of the Sinocephaly, which translates to mean dog-headedness. And so there's supposedly races of people that used to exist that had the body of a man and the head of a dog. From what I can gather, this is usually Greek travelers, Greek writers that are describing people that lived super far away. In addition, I think what you could chalk that one up to is exaggeration in the sense that maybe these Greek travelers found a tribe of people and they were cannibals or something like that. The Greek traveler, in order to accentuate how barbaric those people seemed to them, made them into Sinocephaly. I don't think that's based on real physical description either. So if you're still with me, I have gone through a bunch of stuff that I think Dogman is not. And to finally discuss what I think Dogman actually is, we have to look at the true shape-shifting stories. And I'm talking about the things that people actually believed in. And there's a few cultures around the world that believe that shape-shifting, which was an unnatural power, was reserved for shamans or people who were practicing certain unsavory rituals. For example, in Morocco, you have what's known as the Buddha. And the Buddha is a were hyena. And who are the were hyenas? Well, they're shamans, not all shamans, but some shamans who practice a certain ritual in order to shapeshift into that creature. And it's a taboo subject. They don't like to talk about it because it brings a lot of bad energy. So you might say that's a local superstition or a local belief, but this is where it gets interesting because if it's just a local belief, if it's just a local superstition, you would not have someone who does not share those same beliefs 
having experiences that coincide with that. For example, a British officer was stationed in Nigeria in 1918 and was tired of this creature that was attacking his livestock. And reportedly, the creature was biting the heads of his goat clean off. He ended up shooting this creature, which he interpreted as a large hyena, and it was bleeding and it began to run away, so he followed its tracks and was amazed when he found that the tracks morphed into a human's footprints. And he didn't know what to make of that. He never ended up finding the body of the hyena, but later found out that a man from a local tribe had been mysteriously shot and killed. That's the type of story I'm referring to that transcends the belief system of any one person. There's no way a British officer in Nigeria in 1918 shared the beliefs in Buddhas as the local people did. Yet, he had an experience that could only point to a real phenomena, which to me suggests that the shape-shifting witch doctor is not just a superstitious belief or a way of demonizing people, but rather based on something that is actually happening. Now, if you remember the story of Pete Stubb, Pete Stubb donned the, the magical fur belt that transformed him into a wolf, and that was gifted to him by the devil. And the concept of donning the skin of the animal you wish to transform into exists in these types of stories as well. I think most famously we can talk about the Navajo Skinwalker, which specifically involves two aspects that I've already discussed. One, which is a secret ritual that people perform that allows them to transform into these things, but in combination with donning the skin of a wolf or a coyote or a deer. I don't want to talk about that too much in depth because a new movie is about to come out and that's called American Werewolves 2 Skinwalkers. And that is all about the Navajo Skinwalker tradition, if that's what you want to call it. And I was fortunate enough to work on that and I got to meet a lot of the Navajo people who have had experiences with skinwalkers and claim to have knowledge of these things. And I can honestly say that they believe in these things and they believe that these things are true physical transformations, that it's not a person cosplaying as an animal, but rather a person through some secret magic, through some black magic, is transforming into something else. The other interesting aspect of the Skinwalker as well is the fact that they're not perfect transformations. That it is not a person perfectly transforming into a wolf or a coyote or a deer. Instead, they're retaining some of their human characteristics while also gaining animal-like characteristics. So something like an upright canine now sounds like it's kind of in the realm of possibility because obviously the traditional werewolf has aspects of both human descriptions and animal descriptions. And just like you have with the Buddha, there are people who are not Navajo, who don't share the Navajo belief system, also encountering what could only be described as a skinwalker. So again, you have people of different backgrounds encountering something that could only be described the same way. And to me, that points to a real phenomenon. I was looking at a map I had made one day of where different types of creature sightings were located. I was focusing mostly on the upright canines and Bigfoot. And I was looking at the pattern it was creating and it reminded me of something. And I suddenly realized I'd seen that pattern before in a different book. And I had a newly out book on Wisconsin effigy mounds, which were considered highly sacred places to people. And they represented in very stylized motifs animals such as bear, there were giant eagles, things like that. And then there were these very strange things that were the settlers called lizard mounds because they had very long tails. Eventually it was realized that the Native Americans called them 
spirit animals or water panthers, one or the other. I discovered that wherever there were concentrations of the effigy mounds representing these water spirit or water panthers, there were also concentrations of sightings of the upright wolf-like creatures. And it was so startling, I did an overlay and they matched perfectly. And I'd been trying to talk to some of the elders of the whole chunk tribe for a long time. They're notoriously close-minded about some of these things. And it's felt now that it was probably their ancestors that built these effigy mounds. And so I called the tribal cultural chairman and told him what I had described. And I immediately had an appointment with an elder who was also an anthropologist. And they have been themselves very interested in the meanings and purposes of these mounds. And so I had a, a talk with her. She confirmed for me what I had heard from other tribal members of not just in Wisconsin, but in other states. When I asked them what they thought the true nature of these upright canines were, they said, well, we believe that these and the Bigfoot are not normal, usual, modern animals, that they're very old, that they were here before we were, and that they came from the spirit world. And they believe the entrances and exits to the spirit world are found in um, spring waters, any kind of running spring water, which again, the southeastern Wisconsin area is very rich in. This has held true almost to any Native American tribe that I've talked to. They believe they're spirit animals, that they can come and go between the world. I've kind of refined myself that line of thought because sometimes they seem very solid, but then they disappear or they fade gradually or they're just shot through with bullets and they still just kind of limp off. And it seems to me that these things appear on a continuum of energy, if you will. And it goes from our world to what they would call the spirit world with space in between, intermediate stages in between. That's the only way I can account for the various types of things that people have seen and experienced. And again, it is just mere conjecture on my part, but it's an educated guess because I've spent 27 years going through everything I could possibly find. And that brings me to the last tradition. And this is actually a personal story relayed to me by my own grandfather. I wanna make this clear though, this story did not happen to my grandfather, it happened to a close friend of my grandfather. So for some background, my grandfather comes from the country of El Salvador, which is in Central America. In El Salvador, we don't really have werewolf legends per se, or shape-shifting stories per se, but we do believe that there is possibility of shape-shifting through witchcraft. Now, I can't vouch for the credibility of my grandfather's friend, but I can vouch for the credibility of my grandfather. And my grandfather certainly believed that his friend was telling him the truth when he shared this story. As the story was told to me, his friend was on his way home at night and was walking and under the light of the street lights, he was able to see this large dog up the road in front of him. And the way my grandfather explained it is that every step that this dog took, it transformed into a person. And he saw it. And this creature, this thing, knew that it had been seen. And so what ended up happening is that for several nights in a row, he was then visited by a large dog that attacked his house and would get up on his roof and try to claw his way in and would growl at him. And he shot at this thing a number of times, but his bullets didn't seem to have any effect. He had to visit a witch who told him that the only way to get rid of what he was experiencing was to have cursed bullets. And so it's kind of like the silver bullet idea, but it's interesting. So he gets these bullets cursed, this thing visits him again, and he shoots at it with the cursed bullets and he hits it. And then it runs away and it never comes back again. I also want to mention that there is a cultural difference between first world countries like the United States where superstitions 
and beliefs in witchcraft are kind of relegated to the sidelines because we're all into our scientific method. But in a lot of third world countries, the beliefs in a very spiritual world is still very prevalent. And I don't think they're any less intelligent and I don't think they're any less valid than our own beliefs. In some ways, I think they are more valid. There was a long time when, you know, I really was not too averse to looking at these creatures as something sort of fun in a way, interesting, nothing really to think too darkly about. But the moment that really changed all of this for me was when I was on assignment with a TV show in Michigan and we had set up a spotlight in the road. It was a very isolated gravel road and it was next to an old building and that I think was once a schoolhouse. So we had a cameraman who had his camera set up on a tripod. We had been there all day with these three witnesses and I had a Native American man who was also a game warden for a Native American land reserve. And he was the one that sort of sobered me up to the possibility that there could be a lot more to these creatures. His name was uh, David Walks as Bear. And he seemed to think that there was a connection with Native American practices and some occurrences of sightings of these creatures. And when you're standing out on a gravel road, literally in the middle of nowhere, it was like 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning because that's where and when the sightings had taken place. It was about 96 degrees at that time of night with almost 100% dew point. I mean, it was just fixing the rain. There was lightning and thunder. And we're standing out totally defenseless on this gravel road. And all night long, we'd been seeing like yellow eye shine in the bushes. One time we heard something shaking itself out like a wet dog in the foliage, maybe 30 feet away at the most. And I turned around toward the spotlight and saw the spine of something as it started to cross the road, just out of range. And all that was illuminated was the spine and it was gray fur. And on the other side of the road, there was this, uh, road sign that um, was blotted out. It was one of those reflective road signs, said dead end or something. It was blocked out just momentarily as this thing went past it. And at that moment, I thought this could be something real and it could get us, you know, and what's stopping it? And it was just kind of a sobering thought, you know, because you realize it's real. And one of the witnesses that saw it just started freaking out because it was too much they had seen the full things and, and knew what it was. And that was just kind of a, a watershed moment for me. Now I know I'm not gonna change anyone's minds about this subject, but I do want to at least cause you to give it a second look, give it a second thought, because people are reporting something. And like I said, even if we go with 50% of these people are misidentifying things, we have 50% of people who are saying that they've seen something and they saw what they saw. And what is that? What does that mean? You know, for me, the answer isn't a biological phenomenon. I don't think it's a demon from hell, but I think it's people performing some sort of ritual or sorcery, for lack of a better term, that are transforming themselves in an unnatural way. I think something like that is incredibly rare. I don't think that it happens all the time. I, and I really don't believe it's happening as often as people are reporting Dogman sightings. Because ever since Dogman has exploded onto the scene, the majority of what people are reporting is probably not even real. It's almost like a popularity contest at this point. You know, whoever's got the scariest Dogman report gets, gets social clout. And so, Unfortunately, what that does is that discredits the legitimate witnesses who are having actual encounters with a very, very rare phenomena that's been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. One of the problems with the dogman phenomena is a lack of physical evidence. 
But on the same token, there hasn't been that much research that's being done. But the sightings, they go back a lot of years. I actually was one of the first people to conduct lie detector tests, polygraph tests on witnesses. And literally, I think 90% of them passed. So I found that very interesting. But the problem is there's just a lack of evidence. The eyewitness accounts are very compelling. I've talked to numerous witnesses. I just don't know what to make of it. I think it's just kind of in its infancy. Maybe there is a new species and maybe there's not. And that's the reason why we investigate these things because I think that the question of what causes people to believe they've really seen a werewolf is just as interesting as what if there is actually such thing as a werewolf. I appreciate you watching. I hope to explore Dogman further. There's more historical cases. I hope to interview some Dogman witnesses myself in the near future. And I can't wait to share that with you guys. So thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next one.